Morning, everyone. What a difference it makes having a sunny day, doesn't it? Fantastic. Let me pray. Keep that passage open. I think it was page 1118, Colossians chapter 3. Uh, it's a long reading, but we're going to be focusing our attention on verses 1 uh, to 4 as we look what, at what it means to say that we are raised uh, with Christ. So let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that your spirit opens our eyes to be able to read it and to understand it. And Lord, may we be those today who don't just understand your word, but put it into practice. And so we pray for your power to enable us to do that as we follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're coming towards the end of our uh, resurrection series, uh, Love Wins. Uh, we've been looking at what it means to say that we live as Christians resurrection lives today. And we've looked at some amazing truths. I'm sure you'll agree. We've looked at, uh, we've defined resurrection. And we've said that resurrection isn't simply going to heaven. It is our bodies, our physical bodies being raised from the dead, just like Jesus was, and coming back into life. We looked at how that is applied not just to ourselves as individuals, but to the whole of creation, and that God is in the business of making all things new, and that one day there will be new creation. Uh, we looked at uh, what uh, it means to have eternal life, and we saw again that isn't simply going to heaven when we die, but it is uh, to enjoy union with Jesus today that we are divine human beings as we've been united to Christ. And this week and next week, we're going to look in a little bit more detail at what difference some of those extraordinary truths actually make to our lives as Christians. So I'm starting off in Colossians 3, and then next week, Rick is going to be looking at Romans 6. What difference does it make? Does the resurrection make? And how is that difference made? And this morning, we're going to uh, look at one simple idea, and that is that Paul calls us to be heavenly minded. Be heavenly minded. He says, because you've been raised, verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Be heavenly minded. Now, your reaction to that might be negative. Negative. Because our culture's reaction to that is quite negative, I think, and we live immersed in our culture. I think there's something of a reaction against uh, a guy called Plato, who was a Greek philosopher. Uh, he didn't really like the physical world or matter. He thought that the purer forms were spiritual, and so life was all about leaving your body behind and reaching up to the heavenlies. That had quite an impact on Christianity, and certainly uh, in uh, medieval Christianity meant that uh, lots of uh, Christians had quite a negative view about sex, and we still get blamed for the environmental catastrophe because of, of this idea that, that the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. But what we've seen, actually, is that that isn't really true. That's not what Christians believe, but our culture still feels like, well... That's sort of negative. Being heavenly minded is not something you want to be. And so we have phrases like, oh, you're just a little esoteric, aren't you? And that means that you, you can't really live life as it is. Or you've got your head in the clouds. Or you're a bit of a space cadet. They're not positive terms, are they? Similarly, in reverse, when we think of kind of earthly things, we're much more positive about it. So we say that you're down to earth. That's a good thing to be, isn't it? Or you've got your feet on the ground. That's a good thing to be as well. Or uh, you're, you're practical and you're rooted. All of those things to us feel good. And we have, we've coined that phrase in the West, haven't we, that we can be so heavenly minded that actually we're no earthly use. So heavenly minded no earthly use. But Paul, here in this passage, says something very different. Because if you uh, follow on from uh, verses 5 onwards, what you see is a very practical set of teachings. Lots of instruction for us in the way that we ought to live in our day-to-day -day lives. And yet, 
those practical teachings, they're all rooted in verses 1 to 4. And so what he's saying is actually, the more heavenly minded you are, then the more earthly good you will be. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at three things. We're going to uh, look at why it is we need to be heavenly minded. And we're going to say without being heavenly minded, actually our lives are going nowhere. We're going to look at what heavenly mindedness actually is. And we're going to say that it is, it's, it's looking up. We need to look up to Jesus. And then we're going to finally kind of just ask the question, well, how does it work? How in practice can we be heavenly minded? We're going to dig down. So let's start, shall we, with uh, why we need it. That without heavenly mindedness, life is going nowhere. I don't know about you, but my life has been hugely shaped by stories of other worlds. I love stories. I love adventure. I love science fiction. I love fantasy. I remember uh, my first job. I was uh, working in a bookshop, and I had a lunch break up in the attic of the bookshop. And it was a dusty attic with piles of books everywhere, uh, old tomes. It was quite dingy and, and dark. Somehow it felt mysterious. And I was reading a novel by Stephen Lawhead. Uh, it was part of his Song of Albion trilogy. And... Uh, uh, and uh, it was about a, a, an Oxford student who accidentally stumbled upon a portal into another world. It was called a thin place, a time between times. And as he went through that portal, he came out the other side and he found himself no longer in Oxford in the 20th century, but he found himself in ancient Celtic Scotland. And so began these incredible adventures where he found himself to be a Celtic warrior and finally a Celtic king. And it was great to be reading that kind of story in an attic in a bookshop. And I just thought, perhaps over in the corner, there was another thin place that I could walk through and find myself to be a Celtic warrior with a suitable physique. It never happened. But it, that wasn't, that wasn't a, an isolated incident. Comics, uh, role play, all of these were hugely important to me. I'm a big fan of superheroes, so if you haven't seen Avengers Assemble, go and see it. Who's seen it? One person. Right, okay, there's a lot of people. You need to go and see it. Some great things. Great movie? Exactly. There we go. Two recommendations. I love superheroes. Transformers. Who's seen Transformers the movie? Don't let me down. Six people. Deary me. If you haven't seen Transformers the movie, you actually haven't lived. Yeah. And, and now there are three of them. Star Wars? Yes, that's more like it. Do you know, my wife had to sit through all uh, six movies before she was allowed to marry me. That was pretty important. We actually spent a holiday last year looking at, uh, or I was watching with Amelia, The Clone Wars, uh, which was a series at 10 o'clock for half an hour every day for the whole of the holiday. It was a brilliant cartoon. If you haven't seen that, that's a good one to watch as well. And you know, these things, they taught me the difference between good and evil. They taught me heroism. They taught me about courage. And God used them to prepare my heart to receive his son. I really do believe if I hadn't experienced any of those things, if I hadn't experienced that other world, I would never have understood the power of the gospel. My imagination was captured by these stories. It was formed by these stories. And I don't think it's just my own life. I think every life is shaped by stories of other worlds. Just think of all our popular myths and legends. They've all got similar plots, haven't they? Ordinary heroes. Ordinary guys going about their lives and suddenly something intervenes and they're whisked away to another world or another dimension or another land. And there they have these extraordinary adventures and they, and they live life to the full. It's like extreme living and they experience extraordinary battles and, and great victories and they witness incredible heroism. 
And of course, at some point, someone somewhere sacrifices themselves and lays down their life for them so they can go on. And the world that they have been drawn into is, is somehow it's larger than life. It's the ultimate world. It's, it seems to be reality as it was meant to be. And so when they go back towards the end of the movie or the end of the story to their ordinary lives, something has changed. It's not the same anymore. And their lives aren't the same anymore. No longer are they afraid of the things that they face in their day-to-day -day life because they have faced greater dangers and overcome them. They're more self-controlled than they ever were before because they have uh, seen great kings and warriors and leaders living lives of self-control and focus. And suddenly they're more willing to lay down their lives for their friends because someone has laid down their life for them. Just think of that great scene in Lord of the Rings where the companions are running from the Balrog and Gandalf turns around on the bridge and he declares, you shall not pass. And he sacrifices himself. That's a great scene, isn't it? It shapes your humanity, doesn't it? It shapes mine. You see, to live well, we all need healthy imaginations. And that's how we as Christians ought to live, isn't it? By faith, our imaginations have been captured. They've been set on fire. We've seen a greater world. We have encountered the most beautiful life we will ever encounter. We have seen for ourselves the realities of good and evil. We have experienced defeat and the greatest victory of all. And someone has sacrificed themselves for every one of us. And the power of this story is that it is true. It is true. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. It's true. And so Tim Keller, the um, Presbyterian pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City in Manhattan, he says this. He says, Christians ought to live as if they died, gone to heaven, and come back again. That's how we ought to live, as if we had died, gone to heaven, and come back again. You see, without that sort of healthy imagination, it's difficult to make sense of the world in which we live. We lose purpose. We scrabble around looking for meaning and significance. We begin to lose momentum in our lives. We can't see the wood for the trees. No longer are we sure where we're going. You see, if this world is all there is, then how we live doesn't matter. We can't really define right or wrong. We have no idea what true greatness looks like. That's why we need to be heavenly minded. Because without it, we're going nowhere. But what does heavenly mindedness mean? What does it mean when Paul says, look up, set your minds on things that are above. I just want to put one thing to rest at this point. Being heavenly minded doesn't mean just daydreaming about heaven all the time. It doesn't mean thinking about the endless billion year long worship service that heaven's going to be, or the clouds that we're floating along eating slices of Philadelphia. None of those things. <laughs> that is not what heavenly mindedness is. Paul says, that heavenly mindedness is realizing, understanding, and believing that Christ is your life. Look at what he says, verse 3 and 4. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. That is what we are to set our minds on. We have died, he says, Look, verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ. Verse 3, for you died, since you died, same word. This is what you are to do. Set 
your hearts on things that are above. We have died and we have been raised with Christ. That's past tense. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. You see, this is the, the greatest truth of Christianity. It's not a call to emulate or to imitate Jesus. It's not a call to obey Jesus or simply to uh, admire him or even to love him. The greatest truth of the Christian faith is this, that we live life in Christ. That I am, and if you follow him, then you are in Christ. And that means that everything that is true of Jesus is true of you. Just dwell on that for a moment. Everything that is true of Jesus is true of you. So Jesus died our death in our place on the cross. But we died his death with him, in him, on the cross for the sins of the world. Because he did, you did. That's an extraordinary truth, isn't it? Not only have we died with Christ, we were raised with Christ. When Jesus was raised, you were raised with him. And now he is at the right hand of the Father. The right hand was the place of honor. It was if the throne was here, uh, the right hand was here. (laughs) Get it right? And uh, it was on the same level. It was the place of honor, the place of dignity, the place of privilege, the place of highest standing. And Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. It's not just the place of privilege, it's also the place of of intimacy, of fellowship, because of course you've got the, the ear of the King. And Jesus is at the right hand of the Father because... He has lived this life of love, of humility, of nobility, of courage, of integrity, of self-sacrifice. And as he comes to the Father, the Father's heart bursts in love for his Son. Not just because of who he is, because of all that he has done. And he welcomes him, embraces him, and sits him at his right-hand side. And you know, the incredible truth is that's your place too. Because everything that is true of Jesus is true of you. God delights in you as if you had done everything that Jesus has done. If you had lived his life, if you had cared for the sick and the poor, if you had proclaimed the gospel, if you had laid down your life for the sins of the world... Because in him, you have. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what verse 3 means. That's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? That's almost too much to grasp. And so I have to ask, do you believe it? Do I believe it? Do we understand it? Do we, can we get our heads around it? Because actually what it presents us with is the the one really good reason not to believe. I remember when I was uh, speaking to my dad. He's not a Christian. He's 80 this year. He's still not a Christian. Pray for him if you would. And uh, I remember just sharing something of, uh, of Jesus with him. And he just looked at me and he said, Rod, I can't believe that because it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. It can't be that simple. And that is the one good reason not to believe. And maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, I don't believe because it is too good to be true. And I'll just say to you, please try. Try to believe. Because if you understand it, you'll take a bullet for it. If you understand it, you'll never get tired of it. Relish it. Rejoice in it. Remind yourself of it every 
day. So look up. Heavenly mindedness is not thinking about heaven. It's realizing that what is true of Jesus is true of you. Because Jesus is your life and he's my life. But how do we do it? How does it work in practice? How can we be heavenly minded? Well, we have to dig down. You see, Paul makes it clear that to be heavenly minded, we have to first stop being earthly minded. Now, what I mean here is not uh, kind of following a set of rules or a program of self uh, improvement. This is a change of heart, not will. Something different altogether. And so he says, set your hearts on things above. But actually, we set our hearts on earthly things, don't we? Earthly things become our life. That's how the heart works, psychodynamically. Look at uh, verse 5, the first kind of list of, of, uh, of sins, I suppose, that Paul writes there. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, we're tempted to read that as if they are uh, just a list of independent, unrelated sins, and we tick the list off. I've sorted sexual immorality, I've sorted lust, sorted greed, sorted idolatry. Oh, dear, I'm still wrestling with impurity. You know, all, you know it, that's not how you should read it. It's much better to think of it as uh, the, the, the thread holding a garment together. If you get hold of one end of it and pull the thread, the whole thing unravels. So what we've got here is a list of symptoms with the root cause exposed for us to see. And so what we see here is that sexual immorality, work it back through impurity and lust, you get to evil desires and idolatry. Now, evil desires, this is a really important idea. Uh, And the way it's translated in the English is really unhelpful because it makes us think... Uh, These desires are the desires for evil things, doesn't it? But in the Greek, the word is epithumia, epi-desires. And epi means over. So these are over-desires, inordinate desires, extreme, excessive desires, where something that is good has become something that is ultimate, something that is good, has become your life. And if you then flick on to verse 8, we're not going to look at it now, but that shows you how uh, over-desires work in community. It produces anger, that's the root, and then it works its way out in a variety of different symptoms. You see, when we see that, that this, this idea of the thread, then that helps us diagnose those over-desires that we're wrestling with ourselves. It helps us to dig down, to trace those desires back to their source, back to our emotions, our hearts. And I just want to give you three uh, practical questions to help you dig down so that you can no longer set your minds on earthly things, but you can set your mind instead on Christ. So three questions. What things, if you lost them, would make you feel like you'd lost your life. It could be anything. It might be an object, uh, like a car. It might be a condition. It might be people. It might be a member of your family. It could be the relationships that you have. Anything. It doesn't need to be good or bad. Well, it can be either good or bad. But if you lost it, if you no longer had it, you would despair because you f- would feel like you'd lost your life. Question one. Question two, what do you rely on? What do you uh, turn to when life is difficult? Do you turn to drink? Do you go shopping? Do you turn to the person you love? What, What is it that you turn to when life is difficult? Third question, what provokes extreme negative emotions in you? So, not anger, but real bitterness and rage why does that take over you suddenly? Or uh, not sadness, but, but 
despair and despondency? Why has that suddenly grasped your heart? Or, or not simply fear, but paralysis. You're absolutely petrified at losing something. So three questions that can help you kind of excavate your heart and your emotions. That helps you dig down. Because as you dig down, what Paul says you will uncover in verse 5 are your idols. The idols of your heart. That's what you trace your your kind of over-desires back to. Your idols. Those little gods. The functional saviors, if you like. That if you possess them, you believe they will save your life. They will make your life complete. They will make you happy. They're good things but they've become ultimate things. And so we find, we look to these things to give us a sense of identity and purpose, a sense of significance and meaning. And without them, our lives are lost. You see, Paul here speaks of of radical change. He speaks of transformation, what we might call conversion. This is not behavior modification. This is a change of our motivations, our hearts, our desires. He goes so far as to describe it in an extraordinary way. He says, our old self has been taken off, and we're to put on our new selves. So how can you have that sort of life change that seems as if your old self has gone completely and you are altogether new? Well... Paul says here that real change takes place when you say that Jesus is my life. That's what it means to set your heart on heavenly things, to make Christ your life. And so what I'd love you to do this week, however long it takes, is to have a conversation with your idol. Once you've identified it, have a conversation with it. it goes, there's just three stages to it, really simple. The first thing you say is, look, you've got my heart. It feels like life isn't worth living without you. And the truth is, you are good, number one. Acknowledge it's a good thing. But, number two, you are not my life. Say that to your idol with as much force as you can muster. You are not my life. And the third, you declare over it that Christ is your life. Because what is true of him is true of you. That's why you can say it. What is true of him is true of you. That is the gospel. It's not a list of behaviors. And what you'll see is exactly what Paul describes here. Out of that Belief out of that understanding flows a life of virtue. We will begin to put on the new self. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Flick down to verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, all these virtues, they are rooted in what God has done for us. He has forgiven us. He loved us first before we loved him. They're rooted in Jesus. And so to produce these virtues, you don't try and make them happen through sheer determination and force of will. You set your heart on things above. You make Christ your life. And you do it every day because our lives are just like gardens, aren't they? When you pull out the weeds, you leave them for a few weeks and they're coming back again. It's a bit like doing your teeth. You can't do your teeth once a week, can you? You wouldn't have nice teeth. You know, and we're trying to overcome that kind of British reputation for bad teeth, aren't we? (laughs) You've got to do your teeth twice a day. And it's the same with this. So Paul says, dig down. It's not trying harder. It's not an exercise of willpower. It's removing those earthly things, those idols that have become our life. And so just to wrap it up, 
Paul says that actually the most heavenly-minded really are the most earthly good. Because without heavenly-mindedness, we are going nowhere. And heavenly-mindedness means that we are to look up to Jesus, to make him our life, to realize that what Jesus is, we are by faith in him. But that heavenly-mindedness also means that we are to dig down, we are to excavate, we are to uncover our over-desires and our idols. And you see, the wonder is, is that radical change, this sort of radical change that Paul talks about, it's possible, and it's possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's possible because you have been raised with Christ. That your life is hidden in Christ. That Christ is your life. Only him. And so you can take off your old self. You can dig down. And you can put on your new self as you look up. You can be heavenly minded. Amen.